grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In sports or, or in any sort of workplace, really, for that matter, or management, sometimes a, a new head honcho is brought in for a variety of reasons, but sometimes it's to make changes, to fix problems, or perhaps bring new energy and vitality to a work environment. Well, the beginning of the Gospel of Mark sort of reminds me of a new coach's first press conference, or a new boss coming in and making significant and meaningful changes on the very first day at the job. He or she doesn't beat around the bush. They get right down to business and make critical changes. Well, Mark's gospel is perhaps the most intense out of all the gospel accounts. Jesus comes blasting onto the scene. We really don't hear anything at all about his birth or his childhood. We just hear him arriving on the scene with a bang. um, Jesus does not, throughout the gospel of Mark in particular, back down from confrontation. In fact, he has come to battle evil. Uh, uh, Jesus, as I said, he really wastes no time getting down to business. Uh, Jesus, at this point, uh, we're only 21 verses in, but he's already overcome the tempter in the wilderness, although the brevity with which Mark treats this might indicate that Mark doesn't think the outcome was ever really in any question. Um, Only 21 verses into the story, the very first miracle of Mark is Jesus casting out a demon. Jesus is really setting the tone here. He's gunning for the devil and for evil itself. Make no mistake about it. Jesus has come to cleanse the world and destroy wickedness. Um, Jesus sees the issues that are going on in the world, and he's not just going to talk about them. He's going to do something about them, and that's something that people often appreciate. Um, most, Most of the Jews in Jesus' day understood, they didn't have to be told, that things were screwed up. Uh, For starters, most of the, uh, barely any of the faithful were happy with the current political situation. After all, they were under the Roman rule. And plus, they had not heard from a prophet in years, in in, uh, centuries. And Yahweh had not miraculously intervened in over 500 years. Now, you could talk about little miracles maybe, but Most Jews would completely understand and would agree that this time they were waiting for God to do the kind of thing that he typically did when his people got in trouble, and that's show up and really do something dramatic and save his people, and not, oh, okay, well, you interpret it that way, but in a no question, God's people were saved and rescued, and they couldn't have done it on their own. That's what Yahweh did in the Old Testament, but he hadn't done it for over 500 years at this point. Ever since the exile, God's people had been painfully aware of God's lack of involvement. Um, The shock was not that it was happening in Jesus. The shock really, though, was how long it was taking. God still had not come back to rescue his people, even though it really seemed like the time was perfectly ripe at instances like the Maccabean Revolt when God's people uh, stood up against tyrants, and yet nothing happened. God didn't show up. It seemed like to the Jews God had missed a golden opportunity to come back and fight for his people. However, Jesus makes a bold, audacious uh, announcement. The time has come. That's what he means. He means God is back. He's not saying anything else or just like, okay, hear the news. He's saying, it's time. God is returning. The kingdom of God is near. And what were God's people supposed to do about this? Well, repent and trust. Trust the good news. Uh, That's kind of the short version of today's sermon is this. Take seriously that God has arrived in Jesus, that he has won the battle. Listen to him. Repent and place your trust in him. Because Jesus 
actually gives us all that we need with how to live in this world and how to have his kingdom return among us. Uh, the Bible has always clearly proclaimed certain things. And one of those things, the Bible's always said, there is a clear right and wrong. Now, that doesn't mean it never says there's no gray areas, but there is clearly things that are right and there are things that are not right. And what um, Yahweh had consistently and vehemently said that he did not approve of things like wickedness or corruption or injustice or hatred or abuse. Rather, uh, he wanted things to be good. He wanted uh, things to be fair and just. What's more, he's God. So he had the power to do something about it. Injustice, pain, and suffering didn't just bother God or annoy him a little bit, like, I wish that wasn't going on. No. The God of the Old Testament and the New Testament is a God that is driven to fix evil, to do something about it, to fix injustice. Well, Jesus comes in in Mark's gospel, and that's exactly what he's going to be doing. He faces the evil one, he calls the disciples, and the very next thing Mark tells us he does is he begins driving out demons. Or so, as Mark describes them, Mark interestingly calls them unclean spirits. Because, you see, that is really, as Mark's gospel goes on, that's the real problem uh, here. It's unclean spirits. Now, um, I don't mean uh, we need to imagine demons behind every corner, although I certainly can't guarantee you that there aren't demons around either. There are somewhere, but uh, it may be a waste of time trying to figure out where exactly they are. But the reality is certainly there that there are evil forces in this world, and demons undoubtedly do interfere at times. To ignore them would be a, a fatal mistake, but uh, we don't defeat them. Instead, we rely on Jesus and trust in him to take care of them. Uh, but these unclean spirits are a, a clue, Mark gives to us, of an even deeper and universal reality, the reality of sin within us. You see, Mark refers to these demonic beings as unclean spirits, uh, in part because Mark spends a lot of time focusing on what it really means to be pure and good, but also in particular because he wants us to focus on the spirit of a human being or of a, our souls, we might say. Um, he wants us to focus inside on the humanity as the core of the problem that's going on. It's not primarily about external issues such as politics or legal issues, although the world is certainly a better place, undoubtedly, when good and fair politicians and rules exist. But these things, they're, they're not the main issue, certainly not in Mark's gospel, um, or any of the gospels, really. They are simply, they may be real problems, but they are kind of the surface-level problems and not the root issues. All these kinds of things are stopgap measures. They can only ever really do so much. The real issue is the heart, the mind, or, or better yet, the soul of a human being or human beings. As Jesus says later to the Pharisees in Mark's gospel about this very thing, he cries out and says, listen to me, everyone, and understand nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. What Jesus is saying is, Evil is more an issue of what you take in, not of food that you take in, but in what you take in is what's going, in, going on around you, outside you, and what you let sink into you. Even though Jesus is pretty obviously exasperated when the disciples don't get this, he still explains it to them. Food doesn't really make someone spiritually unclean, not in their soul. Food... Jesus says, not me, food goes in one end and out the other. What seeps into a person's soul, that's what makes him unclean. What, makes, what comes out of men's hearts makes them unclean. Evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, evil, slander, arrogance, and folly. 
All these evils come from inside, and these make a man unclean. Uh, in other words, the evil is primarily an issue of souls, a spiritual issue. So it makes sense that we need to lean on the Holy Spirit to help us out, to find a real solution to the biggest and baddest problems in this world, we need God's help. We need, specifically, the Holy Spirit and Jesus. It's not just about results or control or power, but about letting the Holy Spirit convict us of sin and, and also convince us of our contentment in Christ and forgiveness through Him to give us that peace that passes all understanding. And it's about, instead of letting our emotions or our grievances drive us, we listen to God's Spirit, who speaks to us through His Word, sharing with us and applying Jesus' words into our own lives. Because I think this really is a, the, the uh, perspective of the Gospels. Evil is not primarily, not saying it can ever happen, but it's not primarily a political or a national issue, it is first and foremost a spiritual issue. And furthermore, a war waged on evil is waged against the evil within me. It's easy to demonize individuals or opponents or groups, but the issue, it turns out, is more deeper, more complicated, and frankly, more personal. Uh, so, how do we battle evil? Well, we can, only, we can only ever successfully battle evil with Jesus. We have no hope without his Holy Spirit leading us. We fight evil in our own lives by letting Jesus speak to us and to confront the evil first and foremost in our lives. There's, <laughs> there's stuff in there, there's stuff in here that God needs to work on, I promise you. And Jesus can work on it. I, I promise that as well. The war starts here, but don't worry. Just because we confess doesn't, that we are sinners doesn't mean that Jesus isn't capable of handling it. In fact, he is. In fact, he's promised that he will overcome the evil in this world, even within us. We don't need, we just need to make sure that we don't fight him or doubt him, but rather when he speaks to us, we don't despair. We instead listen to him and learn from him and lean on him as he offers us forgiveness and guidance. When dealing with people or society, uh, we want to make sure that we don't lose track of that spiritual com component of the battle. We keep in mind, for instance, that our fellow human beings are not the enemy. The evil one is. Sometimes that may mean addressing specific sins or trying to heal wounds, or comfort those who are in hurt or pain. However, I think we can also see from the gospel accounts of Jesus that not everyone will listen. Don't, don't be shocked when people reject the message, and don't let that derail you from following God's plan. Jesus, for instance, accepted and knew that some would reject his message or his kingdom and would refuse to apply it to their lives, yet he still sought to confront, to heal, and to forgive. If the primary issue is a spiritual issue, uh, then the primary answer is also a spiritual answer. Uh, and so that's, again, why we absolutely, when we're thinking about evil in this world, we've got to always remember and listen to the Holy Spirit and not just rely on not rely only on a solution that is simply material or physical. Um, now, that doesn't mean that following God doesn't include material and physical things, but the solution has got to come from the Holy Spirit, from the Word. Uh, that means that peace and wholeness cannot be found, can, can only really, ultimately, truly be found in things like what we already are doing and committed to, confessing and repenting announcing God's forgiveness and God's peace to us no matter what is going on in the world around us. I think it also means opening ourselves up to the Holy Spirit by listening, being, being ready to be attentive when the Holy Spirit is 
tugging on our conscience or our conversations. What I mean is that sometimes when we get, we can get so, we can be out of touch with the, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is there in our lives, but when we just kind of go at a, 100 miles an hour, we don't take any time to, to stop or listen. It's easy to let our emotions or our own plans carry us away. Um, you, you can't really hear God's Spirit very well if you're always talking, right? just like anyone else. A, a, a person cannot hear what you're saying if they're only ever talking. And the same is it true in our relationship with God and in His leading in our life. If all we're ever doing is going and doing and, and, and talking ourselves, but never listening to what God says, never taking a, a breath before doing something or a moment uh, to pray and to listen to the Spirit, well, then it's going to be kind of hard for us to listen to Him if we, we won't take that moment. Sometimes that's really important. A moment, a time to pray, perhaps perhaps when you have opportunity to, to read the Scriptures before we come up with an answer. Um, we need to make sure that we don't lose track of the greatest weapon in our arsenal, God's Word and Holy Spirit. Um, how is evil, how do we, Jesus confronts evil, how do we confront evil? Well, we have to remember it's not defeated by laws or armies, but by Christ crucified. Death is terminated in the resurrection of Jesus. This uh, solution, actually relying on and, and leaning on God's word and and. Christ crucified is the solution of life is not necessarily easy to do. It's sometimes, to use Paul's words, a stumbling block to God's people and foolishness to, to non-Christians. But the cross is our salvation. It's God's way and wisdom and salvation of the world. And because we know the whole story, we know that we have not lost, but rather uh, we have won. And that's why we preach Christ crucified. Because whatever the evil is we're facing, whether it's a, a society evil or our own evil or, or the effects of evil, of the evil world and suffering and hurt and pain or even death around us, we turn to Jesus. He's the only complete solution to the evil in our world. Uh, confession of sins, forgiveness, Jesus crucified and the resurrect. These are not these are not simply doctrinal answers or an answer to a religious question. They are the means by which Christ saves the world in the midst of all its problems and evils. It is a strategy. This is these things church is a strategy, a way that we deal with evil in the world, the way that God most directly deals with evil in the world. Um, uh, the cross uh, of Christ was not just an event. As we think in Mark's gospel, we can think of the cross as, as the battle, as part of the war between good and evil. And we know that at the cross, Jesus battled and overcame evil. Jesus has defeated evil, and so now we are continuing to learn, to, to depend upon that, to live with that in mind, to trust that God has a solution and an answer, even when it doesn't always look like it. We know that Christ is our salvation and that we have peace with God because of him. In Jesus' name, amen.